Well, hello there and welcome to another Jam with Ram. You know, the series where I answer the questions you make me in the previous video. Um, this, week has been, this week has been pretty much uneventful, to be honest. So, there's not a lot to comment about uh, before starting to answer uh, questions. Probably mo the most uh, important thing I have to well comment on is uh, about my first uh, tank video, which you could see the other day. And, um, yeah, there are going to be more um, videos of that. I mean, um, I have been asked this in, in private. It's actually another combat school. It's going to be a completely different playlist <coughs> from the one of the air so in there you will be well we started by seeing how to drive a tank uh, we moved on to see we are going to move on to see how to actually uh, aim your gun in a, in a tank and uh, well that kind of stuff then move on to tactical tr uh, tacti uh, tactical tips like well hold down to red down using terrain masking um, cover etc uh, the mechanics in War Thunder are going to be very different from from that in 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 World of Tanks so yeah I think even while those videos are going to be uh, centered around realism and um, more simulator-like aspects of driving a tank. Um, a lot of that uh, advice can be well used for for arcade. Um, it's, it's very much the same as with planes. Uh, with planes, in historical battles, you need to know a lot more than what you do in arcade. But if you know a lot about well how planes fly and how to extract the best out of your plane, a little bit of energy fighting, uh, air combat maneuvers, etc., which have their full application in historical battles. If you do know about that in arcade, you are going to be much, much, much better than the average gamer. So this is going to be very, very much the same. Um, if you get to understand how tanks uh, drive and fire and um, the proper tactics to use, even while the 100% of that advice is going to be important for historical battles, you can ha have a very big uh, advantage over the u normal usual player who doesn't know that stuff and plays arcade. So I think it's going to be useful for everyone. For those who of you who will play historical battles in, in ground um, vehicles and for those of you who want to just stay in, in arcade mode. Um, another thing, a couple of weeks ago I put a video with an announcement about a uh, competition I'm going to hold. Uh, which is going to... Uh, the intention is to do it weekly and the problem I'm having is exactly because of that. Uh, the thing is, um, we're holding an event, a weekly event, where uh, up to 16 people can join and uh, it will be a series of, of eliminated... eliminated uh, eliminate uh, well yeah a competition uh, with several different rounds and um, the big final I will record it and put up in a video on YouTube and uh, the winner of that um, of that particular game will um, will face me will fight against me in a one v one. I actually had planned to start this maybe three, three weeks ago. The problem is that I can't find a proper schedule and I want to do it more or less the same day and the same hour. At first I was start thinking to do it in Sunday uh, evenings in European time, but the problem is that I'm not being able to so far and probably in the future much less. So I'm probably going to change plans a little bit about that. Instead of being a weekly event, probably I'm going to make it a bi-weekly event. Um, subjected to change, of course, because my... I mean, I have a real life out of YouTube. And um, I can't... It's sad, but it's true. I can't really reserve maybe three hours for a simple single day to hold the event. And I don't want to be toying with you guys uh, like when is going to happen this week. I mean, I want to have a tight schedule, a perfect schedule for all of you to know when to expect the next uh, event. So once I have that kind of thing sorted out, I will make you, well, I, I, I will make a video about that. Also, uh, I have spoken with Gram789, um, a streamer whom I have flown with a couple times and uh, whose stream I usually <laughs> well go around to to chill out uh, probably uh, the events will be streamed live so you can see what's going on uh, but 
of course, that kind of thing also needs a little bit of speaking and talking and fine tuning, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's going to happen. Hasn't happened yet. Um, but as soon as I know when it's going to happen, I'll let you know. Probably, as I told you, it's not going to be a weekly event, as I firstly thought. It's going to be a big weekly event. And quite probably, the day is going to happen, it's going to be on Sundays, but not promising anything. We'll see. So, that said, let's move on to some questions. Ram, would you say your flying, fighting style in War Thunder is more like a wolf or a hawk? Or, if neither, neither of those sounds right to you, what animal do you think suits your flying, fighting style? As well, I think a hawk is very accurate. I mean, a ho hawks um, stay very high in the sky. They look at lower prey, they dive on it, they destroy it <laughs> by hitting it and they feast on them and uh, that's my flight style that's boom and zoom basically hawks are boom and zoomers eagles are very different i mean eagles are more like attackers they go for ground prey they go for snakes they go for rabbits they go for mice uh, they go for that kind of stuff so they actually are air to ground <laughs> animals i'm air to air <laughs> so a hawk a hawk it's actually a pretty good description of how I try to fly. Boom and zoom, baby. It's <laughs> the way I fly by. Uh, next question. Soon we are going to have combined tank aircraft games in War Thunder, and it can work pretty interestingly. But don't you think, Ram, that putting what battle seat in the middle of that would be too much? <sighs> The thing is that from the very few things we have been hearing about warships in War Thunder, um, actually Gaye has noticed that it requires a pretty hardcore player to enjoy playing warships. I'm thinking warships will get their own um, gameplay and game style and matchmaking. Uh, there will be planes as well from carriers, quite probably. Uh, or land aircraft, maybe, who knows. Uh, I think it's going to be, in a way, very similar to the tank concept we are seeing. In tanks, we don't have only tanks, we have tanks and aircraft. Or we will have. I think warships is going to be the same. Warships and aircraft. Uh, tanks probably will be uh, alongside. M makes no sense in, in a map with maybe a few tiny islands to put a lot of tanks there. So probably it will be just planes and warships. Also, uh, warships are going to require a very different game, uh, gameplay. I mean, it's not going to be anywhere close to what uh, aircraft or tanks are. I mean, the longest um, hit ever scored in a warship versus warship scenario was done by um, HMS Warspeed on Julius Cesare in Punta Stilo in the Mediterranean in 1940. And that was 27.5 kilometers. That's a long way. I mean, battleships will move at speeds that will range from 20 to 30 knots. That's one hour. I mean, ships are going to be one hour apart from each other. Think of it. Uh, so it will be, I'm guessing, a very different type of game than what we currently have. Probably we will have planes there as well. But really, warships is something that I'm really much, much, much hyper up with than with tanks. Probably because there has been very few naval uh, war games in in PC for a long while. I think it's going to be a very different playstyle. And yeah, of course, if you think of it, it's going to be a little bit too much to add tanks, warships and planes in a battle with, what, 30 people, maybe. Uh, in that sense, it will. But I'm not, I don't think there will be tank, warships and planes in the games as we know them now. I think the full integration of warships, tanks and planes will happen in World War mode, which we know absolutely nothing about yet, um, but probably will be a more like a persistent world, uh, I'm thinking, I mean, is, is what I expect it to be, a pers persistent world in a very similar fashion to World War II Online or SSI, an arena where there will be all kind of vehicle presence from warships, airplanes or tanks. And they, they, they each one have their perfect uh, reason to be 
in, in the game. So I don't think it's... I mean, I'm sure Gaijin is putting a lot of thought in this. And I'm sure when it comes, it will be enjoyable. I also think it's going to be very, very, very different from what we know uh, now in planes and from what we are going to see in, in tanks. Um, so the thing is, don't think alongside the, alongside the lines of what we have now. It's going to be completely different. Absolutely, because the very few information we have about warships is that the Bengayin is noticing that the current style of battle doesn't work very well with, with warships. So probably we will see something totally different. Exactly how? Well, we'll see. We'll see in the future. Yep, next, next question. Do you think that mouse aimers in historical battles should be prevented from going into spins by instructor? Actually, I do. Yes, I think the current mm, system with its limitations and its problem, like planes wobbling like mad because of instructor, I think is the only way you can get um, people to fly with keyboard and mouse in historical battles. And let's face it, most of the people in historical battles are flying with keyboard and mouse. If that's taken away, uh, the population is going to be, go down in no time. Um, I think it needs to be there, simply because the way keyboard works. I mean, uh, joystick is an analogic device. You have different degrees of input. It's not the same that you take your stick one quarter of the travel down, that if you take your joystick fully down, the input is not the same. It's more gradual. A keyboard is not gradual. A keyboard is purely digital. It's either zero, no input, or one, full input. In any plane, or almost 90% of the plane in, on the, of, of the planes you have in War Thunder right now, from a steady flight situation, if you f do a full back uh, input on the on the stick, you will stall and st and probably spin, because no plane can take that huge change of angle of attack without stalling. It's it's almost insane. Uh, the thing is. The limitations of the keyboard is that it's a digital device. You don't have middle grounds. It's either full travel of the input or no input at all. So you need an instructor and you need something that prevents you to enter into, into stalls uh, and spins. Because otherwise keyboard users would be sp stalling and spinning all the round. I mean, they, they wouldn't be able to use keyboard at all because any use of keyboard would mean on stall. And that can't happen. I mean, it will be unflyable with keyboard and mouse. So I think it's a compromise. Of course, it will be desirable for historical battles to have keyboard users to have chances to spin and, and, and stall if they fly careless, carelessly. My, myself, I'm having problems with that because a lot of planes are doing the helicopter in historical battles. They, when they are following me in a hammer, hammerhead, they will point the nose up and they are able to shoot with the nose up in a situation when in a real plane it's almost impossible to aim. But it's, I mean, that has to be there or or no one will fly historical battles with keyboard and mouse. And let's face it, again, most people fly with keyboard and mouse. Not everyone has a joystick, not everyone has rudders. So not everyone has track air, which is pretty much a must if you are flying with joystick and, and, and rudders. So I think it's a necessary evil. evil. It's something that is necessary for mm, gameplay reasons and from for keeping people interested in, in historical battles. Um, would I like something different? I guess, but the thing is I can't think of any other alternative that keeps the game mode being flyable while putting stalls and spins uh, into a model of gameplay that has you entering inputs with uh, digital inputs, zero or full. It's the way it is, <clears throat> and we have to take it for what it is. So I think it's, it's the best way. Right now we have a compromise, but it's a working compromise. Next question. Ram, what do you think about the new historical battle event in Ruhr? Um I'm not worried about that. I don't care about that. I rarely fly the events anymore. Um, when Gajin introduced events, I actually was opposed to that because it's a 
road is uh, is a way to avoid the problems historical battles were, uh, is having uh, with um, bad matchmaking, wrong tiering of, uh, of aircraft, that kind of stuff. The problem is that they introduced historical battles uh, events with the idea of making historical setups. The problem is there's nothing historical in them anymore. At the beginning there was, but not anymore, because for the simple reason that simply it's, it's as simple as Gaijin is trying to balance, and you can't balance an historical setup. Sorry, but you can't. Things were the way they were. You are not go if you start toggling with balance reasons in an historical setup, it's no longer historical. And they are doing balancing in relation with player skill. And yes, they are doing that. Because uh, it, it's as simple as saying that they, they are teams that, in general terms, let's face it, allied teams are not as good as German teams. Because Germans, for one reason or another, every one of them claims. And allied and UK teams, usually some of the teams climb, uh, but most of them don't. And if you don't climb, you die. Same with the Soviet. It's exactly the same. If you don't climb, you die. The problem is that the teams don't climb. And Gaijin is trying to mouthfeed people to get wins when they don't do what they should in order to win. I also, I recognize, I totally admit that some historical setups are not balanced. And that one side has much bigger chances to win than the other. If things are presented in an historical way. But the way to compensate for that is not messing and balancing an historical setup. Because at the very moment you start balancing, it's no longer historical. And then the event event game mode has no sense. Why why is there? We could be flying historical battles for all we care. It's as, histori it's as, as historical the one thing to the other. It's alternate history, after all. The way to actually balance those events is not giving one team more players than the other, just to give them a higher chance to win. Is not giving them air starts, so they start stop complaining about the enemy planes uh, climbing better. The way to balance it is to offer higher rewards. The um, side which has higher chances to win because they have better planes, or they have more chances based on on the models involved, gets a much lower reward than the pl um, side which is flying the planes that have a lower chance to win. What do you achieve with this? That those that lose battles will get rewarded almost as good as if they won. And if they actually win, they will make a huge, huge, huge profit. That's the way to make uh, historical battles uh, enticing for, for both sides. The winning battle, if they win, it will not rent a lot of credits or, or, or lions or XP. And if you lose, you are going to lose. A lot because you have to repair for your plane, etc. The losing side, even if they lose, they make a profit. If they win, they make a astronomical profit. That's the way you balance things. Not giving air starts, not putting one team with 14 players and the other with 16 or 12 with 16 or 11 with 16. I mean, these things don't work. Simply don't. I mean, the last day I actually flew historical battles with an interest, I went into a battle in Malta, I think it was. And I joined the German side with a Junkers 87. <laughs> because I'm like that. I mean, I'm not the one to get the best plane, uh, plane out, the, out of the event and just milk the cow. I, I want challenges. I like flying underdogs. Let's face it. So yeah, I joined with a Stuka. And as I entered the battle, I noticed and I saw that what the beautiful matchmaker of the, of the event had in place my Stuka with three BF-109s and the enemy had eight broken fighters and two hurricanes. Yeah, that's historical. <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> that's retarded. That's absolutely intolerable. But that's what happened. Um, I lost faith. faith. I don't want to fly events anymore. Simply because they are not events, they are not historical, they are not nothing, they are crap. They are alternate history crap. Um, the way you balance things is not doing that stuff. What happened in Malta? The Germans had their team capped at 10 people. 
and the British have them at 15, at 16, sorry. So, British always have six more players than the Germans. Of course, 10 versus 16 sounds bad, but 4 versus 10 is an absolute disgrace. You want to balance historical battles? Uh, well, historical events. Do the historical event. And stop mouth feeding people who refuse to fly the way they should. Offer them higher rewards if they do a good job. But stop giving them higher numbers just because they can't win, because they lack the skill to do so. I mean, Malta, in the era, uh, the event was set in 1942. In 1942, you had the whole Regia Ar Ar uh, Aeronautica, I mean, the, the whole Italian Air Force attacking Malta, and a whole Luft Luft float, a, a whole fleet of the Luftwaffe attacking Malta. And in Malta, there were a handful of Spitfires, Hurricanes, and a couple of broken fi Boo Fighters to uh, act as night fighters. The superiority was in the German side, in numbers. In that event, we were three bf 109s and one Stuka versus eight broken fighters and two hurricanes. What the hell is historical in that? Absolutely nothing. So I don't fly events anymore. <laughs> they are senseless. Uh, I'd rather fly historical battles. They are as realistic, they are as historical, and I, uh, and I don't rate looking at the setups. So yeah, I don't care about historical battles, about arcade, uh, uh, arcade uh, about event historical battles anymore. Next question. <coughs> yeah, well, next question is the weird question of the week. And this one is beyond weird. Ram, if mind switching was possible and your mother and girlfriend switched minds, the, and the only way to switch them back is to have sex with one of them, would you rather have sex with your girlfriend with your mom's body? Or you're with your mom in your girlfriend's body. Uh, I would break up with my girlfriend and I would marry Natalie Portman. I'm not having sex with my mom. <laughs> Sorry, but no. <laughs> what the f... What, what kind of... Dude, you are seriously messed up. <laughs> How do you come with these questions? This is... I'm not giving... Uh, I, there's no answer to this. I'm not... I, I, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I don't, I'm not having sex with my mom. No way. Not in body or mind. No way. I would break up with my girlfriend and marry Scarlett Johansson. That would be decent, I guess. Oh my gosh. How the hell? <laughs> this question. Um, any chance you can do a guide on how to engage opponent with superior hate advantage? Almost every other video in this channel has that kind of uh, situation, so you only have to see them. I mean, uh, um, l 10 days ago I posted a video about how to fly historical uh, American planes uh, where we were jumped by two German planes with maybe 2,000 meters of advantage. And in most videos you, ha you have me actually um, going against uh, enemies with higher energy situations than mine. So just watch the videos. They are all around the place. No need to do a guide when I'm putting videos of, of that all the time. Um, so yeah, next question. Hey Ram. I know this is probably the wrong video to ask for help on, but w what really bugged me in the early speed, earlier speeds was pulling negative Gs. I'm not sure if it was modeling game yet, but it really gave me mental restriction while flying that thing. Can you explain that feature? Uh, negative Gs in Spitfires. Well, it was a mechanical problem. Well, not mechanical problem, it was a feature. Um, the Spitfire, the first ones, up to the Mark V, early series of the Mark V, had a gravity-fed uh, carburetor. That means that the fuel was uh, entering the, the... well, without gravity there was no fuel. The, the, the engine would starve because uh, fuel was entering the engine because of gravity. Uh, what happens? That if in such an engine you pull negative yeast, there's no gravity fuel doesn't enter the engine, and what happens is that the engine loses power. Uh, that was a problem, a problem that really was a mess up for the British for the earlier war, maybe until 1941, when a new type of carburetor was introduced that prevented that from happening in moderate, I mean, there was a, f I'm not going to enter into technical details, this should come with a schematic and all. It was a carburetor that could ensure that fuel was going into the engine even even with negative yeast for a limited period of time. 
but usually you would you wouldn't be um, doing negative yeast for that long. So in, for all purposes, it solved the problem. Um, on the first specifiers and hybrid case, it was a huge, huge, huge deal. I mean, all the thing, uh, all what a BF and I had to do to avoid the specifier was to pull forward in the stick and do a dive uh, without rolling upside down, and doing that at negative yields. The specifier will have to roll upside down pull on the stick and follow, and given that the Spitfires weren't the best rollers around, that would delay them a lot, giving the German a huge, huge advantage in the dive. Um, in the German planes it didn't happen because the German engines had direct injection to the engine. I mean, the, the fuel was actually forced into the engine by mechanical means instead of relying on gravity. Um, so yeah, that, that's the basis of, of the problem. That's what happened. Uh, gravity was needed to get the uh, fuel running, uh, fuel going into the engine, and with, without that, the engine would cut off. It happens in a lot of places in, in this game, actually. It happens with the Spitfires, it happens with the Hurricanes, the early ones. It happens with a lot of B-planes. Um, you only have to just do a dive without rolling upside down and you will hear the engine power going down like like mad and that's because of that, the engine is starving without fuel so, yep, yeah, that's it for this question next one RAM, should a LA7 be able to pull 12 Gs as I should have that happened to me in an historical battle match? In real life or in the game? In real life, no, no. Um, in the game, it happens all the time, and you can do that for very short periods of time without breaking your wings. But very, very, very short periods of times. In real life, in real life, it's gonna happen. First of all, because the pilot would pass out <laughs> very quickly, and second of all, because in real life, pilots, um, I mean. Planes didn't fly the way they do now. Today, you have a fly-by-wire system where you enter the inputs and a computer moves, orders the, the um, control surfaces to move. And those are servos. I mean, they, they are actually mechanically actuated. actuated. In World War II planes, uh, the, the pilot stick was actually hard, hard wire and linked to the control surfaces through cables, wires, pulleys, rods, that kind of stuff. So what happened was that the faster the plane go went, the more air uh, sleep, uh, air stream would be over the control surfaces. So of course, trying to move a control surfaces into that wind stream at very high speeds required a lot of strength from the pilot. Um, that's mostly compressibility. One of the aspect aspects of air compressibility that is not in the game right now. It's not modeled. And that's why you can pull 12 years. In real life, you couldn't, because the pilot had a, uh, I mean, one should have been to be a troll to <laughs> force the stick back enough to pull a 12 G uh, turn. Um, very high Gs were possible for short periods of time. 9 Gs, even, I think they have been, they were resi registered more than 9 Gs, maybe 10 Gs. But that should be in a split second and not anymore. Um, a high speed pulling back on the stick required a lot, a lot of strength from the pilot. Really, I mean, pilots were really, really, really shaped up. Um, they were in very good uh, condition and they had very strong arm muscles because they had to fly in a plane was an exerc exercise, actually, at very high speeds. In most planes, I mean, in other planes, they have lighter or, or heavier controls. W when you read an, an aircraft description and you read that they have light controls, it's exactly that what they mean. That at high speeds, the controls were still light enough for the pilot to actuate them without a huge effort. Because, of course, after a while, the pilot would get tired and he would be restricted because he wouldn't be able to pull that much anymore. Uh, the problem is, in the game, that's not here yet. And that's why a lot of planes maneuver at high speed the way they shouldn't. BF 109s, uh, CDOs, etc. Uh, just to name a, a, a very limited number of them. There are a lot of planes that historical ha historically had very heavy controls at high speeds that in the game doesn't don't feel like that. But sooner or later, 
we will we will have a compression model in the game and that will be solved. So yeah, but at this moment, uh, LA five, LA seven put in twelve years is nothing out of the ordinary. Happens all the time. So yeah, next question. Ram, teach us some Spanish words or phrases, curse words, <laughs> or some Spanish that is relevant relevant to flying. Uh, no. <laughs> I think I'm too shy to start speaking in Spanish in a video, sorry. Um, if someone asks me ask me something in Spanish, I probably will make a short answer in, in Spanish as well and then do a translation into English. But other than that, no, I, I, I'm not going to some teach you bad words in Spanish. Sorry, but no. <laughs> I teach people how to fly, not how to course. <laughs> sorry. Next question. Ferrari or McLaren? Uh, well, being a Spaniard, that's a easy questions to answer, Ferrari, all the way. McLaren totally effed up uh, Alonso's uh, chances to win his third championship in a row. Uh, and in the end, they didn't win that for Hamilton either. I mean, that year was a um, complete mess. From all sides, I don't think Alonso actually behaved really well that year, but I think that what uh, the, um, McLaren did with Alonso was not fair. They denied him the, the chances to win a title. Uh, and um, yeah, so fuck McLaren, go Ferrari. Even while Ferrari sucks right now, but well, whatever. Next question. Ram, do you blame any particular site like 4chan for the seeding of the interwebs? No, no, no. I blame education. I blame parenting. I blame a society that's so, let's face it, right now the role model is not the good guy, it's not the good family guy, it's the bad guy. It's the um, guy who gets rich without doing anything. Maybe not the role model, but everyone likes those, those guys. I mean, if you see shows like, uh, I don't know, TV does this all the time. They, they really give a representation of people who will stop at nothing to get success. And there's also the kind of mythification of the gangsta style, the 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 bad guy, the guy who's bad, and that's stupid. But kids feel cool being gangsta. What's cool about that? That's wrong education. They are they are being raised into a society that's teaching them the wrong things, and with parents that they don't care about teaching them right. And I blame the society. I mean. People get like this because they are raised in, in the way they are. And yeah, I know there will be a lot of arguing about that. And I, I'm making excuses for people because they were raised in a certain way. But let's face it, the way you're raised makes and forces your character. If you're raised for good things, probably you will turn into a good guy. If you are raised like a moron, you will be end up being a moron. It's very much the same that we happens with 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 a pet. And if you have a dog and you teach him to teach it to bite and to bark and to be an ass, he, you won't be able to get it out without he, it biting something or someone. If you teach the dog to be nice and cool, and it will be nice and cool. And I know, of course, humans are not pets, but still. <sighs> Education is huge. So no, I don't blame any particular site or any particular thing. I blame society because it's promoting a role model which is stupid. I mean, even here in Spain they ha there are some channels that air that shitty thing, Jersey Shore or however it's called, I don't know. I've watched that maybe a couple times. And really? I mean, that's what 18, uh, 15 years old are watching right now. That's the kind of thing they are looking at. That's the kind of stuff they are watching. What are they going to learn from that? How to be a bit? <laughs> or how to be a bad guy? Threatening everyone to kick their ass. It's, it's the society promoting the wrong stuff. And it's the kids learning from the wrong role models. And is the society make? I don't know. I don't know why it's is right now that way. But right now the hero 
He is the bad guy who has a lot of personality, pro personality problems, but in the end, more or less he does the right stuff, more or less. Gets the girl, but he keeps on being an ass. It's the gangsta image. It's, the, 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 it's bullshit. And it's what is making things be the way they are right now. It's a society that models the way they are. And the problem, again, for me, is a society and we, we are making it to be. So, yeah, that's for me. That's the reason for me. Not any particular site or not any particular thing is a global issue, at least in my eyes. Next question. Hey Ram, who is Foxu and why is he so bad? Well, Foxu is a rammer and he's so bad because he rams. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Have you ever wondered about uh, going to another country for some, some time? You seem like the person who, is, who would enjoy getting to know different countries and there is also a, a high unemployment in Spain. I heard that in Canada you can get a job like in a week or so. It certainly would be an interesting experience. The problem is that it would be a nice thing to do if I was 20 years old. But I'm 35. <laughs> and um, right now I'm fo focused on solving my life. <laughs> and just setting my life in the right direction because right now what I do is going to determine exactly what I'm going to do for the next maybe 20 30 years I have to find someone to form a family with um, or maybe I don't have to find that person maybe I already know who knows um, I have to do all that kind of stuff and it's not the proper moment to start traveling. Also, at this moment, I would seriously consider moving into another country if I had a serious job of her. But I can't allow myself to go just wherever and to yeah, go to the adventure. You can allow that when you are 25, 23. But when you are 35, you start to think along more serious terms and to settle down and to form a family and to do that you can't be an adventurer, adventurer and moving into other countries I would enjoy doing that but no, right now it's not an option and besides I have a lot of reasons to stay where I am um, so no not for the moment probably one of the things I'm seriously considering is changing city but that's depending on other factors probably some things happen in my life I will be changing my um, city. I will go to another city to live. Uh, but that that depends on several factors. But no, moving out of the country right now, right now is not an option. In the future, we'll see. Once I have a more or less clear view of um, where I am and what can I win by moving to another country, and I have a family, uh, that might be interesting because as well, moving out and abroad when you have family is interesting for the kids they get to know other places other languages so maybe that's an awesome in the future but right now no not right now next question ram can you recommend any good tv documentaries internet sites on book authors on planes tanks ships and infantry weapons Woof. books oh, many well, the, the problem is depends exactly on the degree of accuracy you want. Because there are more generalistic style authors and they are very in-depth detailed authors. Of course, I will enjoy, <laughs> like mad, and I do enjoy, books which are very in-depth about a single thing. For instance, the Focus 180, or for instance, um, P41, or oh, P51, um, explaining on the minor technical details and how exactly the plane evolved through the series, etc. But the problem is that those mm, books usually are very dry. They are not entertaining read if you don't enjoy exactly what you are reading. And also they are very technical. So for the usual reader, they are going to be boring. As a general thing, I would recommend um, for planes and tanks and, well, for, especially for planes, um, I would recommend <coughs> William Green. Uh, William Green uh, is in, 
one of those authors that covered a lot of stuff and between that was the World War II planes and they he had um, different books on um, uh, aircraft of the Luftwaffe, aircraft of the US, aircraft of the British, um, kind of encyclopedias with a lot of different planes covered in decent detail. I mean, the most famous one had maybe three pages of, of information with general performance um, stats and, uh, well, a decent explanation of the plane. The less famous planes will have a very short uh, description, just in general terms, just telling the story of the plane uh, in very, very slight detail. Um, but I think it's a good starting point for people. I mean, it's not without faults, and of course, it's a very generalistic approach. But to get to know a lot of planes in a single stroke is a very good author. For ships, it's uh, more complicated because ships tends to be really complicated, believe it or not. Um, if you want, um, I don't know if it's still in the catalogs, but I'm going to tell you uh, which was my first English book ever which was an imported book with illustrations uh, that I purchased with, um, well, thanks to getting good qualifications and convincing my dad to promise me that if I got good qualifications, I would get that book because it was really expensive. Um, it was Richard Hamilton's uh, War at Sea. Um, I don't know if it's still in the catalogs, but that was really, really cool. Richard Hamilton was actually a um, royal, I think he was a royal navy sea, um, sailor in World War II, and he was a painter. And he did a lot of paintings about World War II related naval engagements, with an explanation of very, the war at sea in World War II, from the very early beginnings, the <coughs> fights at Norway, the, 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 the Bismarck sortie, uh, the war at the Pacific, uh, Guadalcanal, um, Surigao Strait, that kind of stuff, with illustrations of him. So that was a really, really, really nice book. I still have, but not here right now. Um, but that one was really entertaining read and beautiful to see. Um, for tanks, oof. oh God, probably good against memories. I mean, is not really tank related, it's more strategy related, but I think they are really nice. Even while Guderian was full of shit, let's face it, I mean, he was full of himself to a point it was barely understandable. <laughs> and most of the things he recalls as his memories are actually modifi mo modified to make him appear in a better light. But the grasp of um, the the actual World War II fighting and Blitzkrieg basis is all there. You also get to know <clears throat> why a lot of times tanks with light armor and very light guns were better than tanks with heavy armor and heavy guns. Just because the lighter tanks have uh, three person turrets and radio, while the others didn't. Um, it's, uh, but basically it's, it's the explanation of, of Blitzkrieg and uh, is uh, the foundation of the m a lot of modern tactics and strategies is actually, I think it's a book that started the operational level. I mean, in, in War Thunder, the, in War Thunder, oh gosh. In history, the military history, there usually was a separation between the tactical level, which was the, the battle fought at, uh, at the battlefield, and the strategic level, which was the generals doing the calls at the, high, uh, in, at the headquarters. Basically, Germans introduced a new uh, tactical level in World War II, which was the operational level, which was uh, basically the um, warfare conducted from the army group level. And it's really insightful to read that stuff. Also, Manstein memories is very good. Um, Eric Manstein's. I don't remember the, the name of the book. Hold on a second. Alrighty, it's Lost Victories by Eric Manstein. Probably again with a slight egomaniacal bias, because I think uh, in some cases he's not telling totally the truth, but the insight on how warfare was conducted uh, by the Germans um, during the, the tenure of uh, Manstein as a um, commander 
uh, because he was retired in 1944 because Hitler didn't stand him. Um, it's really insightful. And I think in many ways it shows why the Germans lost the war in, in the Eastern Front. Uh, thankfully they did, of course. Um, I think those two books are really cool. They, of course, they are not dealing directly with tanks. That's the thing. But I think they are amazing, amazing books to read. Um, also, um, there's a very interesting book which is called Knights of the Black Cross, Hitler's Panther Waffe and its leader, uh, from Brian Perret. Um, I don't know if his, the name is like that, Brian Perret. I will try to link all this stuff down in the description. Um, it's a story of the Panther Waffe, the armored uh, fighting force of the, of the Wehrmacht. And really, it's a really, really, really nice read in many ways because it shows the gradual change from of the German armored um, corps from a um, light lightning uh, punch and uh, lightning quick attack force in the early war to the heavy hitter defensive for force it was late in the war. It explains very well the inner politics of uh, and the inner tactical and strategical decisions uh, be, before, behind all the operations. It really explains very well the invasion of France, the invasion of um, the, U uh, the USSR, Barbarossa, the war in the desert, and later on, well, Overlord, um, the, lost in, lost, uh, the lost war la war in the east by the Germans. It's really, really a nice reading and gets a, gives you a very good insight on how actually history was uh, in that sense. I mean, probably people focus a lot on the Wehrmacht as a whole, uh, but really the elite part of the Wehrmacht was uh, the Panzerwaffe. Until, of course, the Waffen SS came around, but that's a different style. And of course, the Waffen SS did more than being soldiers, but whatever. Um, yeah, th there are a lot of books. I really could start. You, you can see that I'm starting listing them and I can't stop. Um, probably I will cover more of this in, in a particular video, giving a review of very interesting books. It's actually a pretty good idea, now I think of it. Um, so, yeah, that's it for this question. Next one. So let's wrap this up for this week with us this list last question, which actually came from a private message. Um, well, it's actually not a question. He actually describes a situation where he was fighting an N1K, um, a Sinden, a Sidenkai, and he was wondering whether he had done something wrong or if there's something wrong with that demonic Japanese plane, as he calls it. Well, there's something definitely wrong with the demonic Japanese planes. First of all, there's not a single accurate zero, zero in this game. They all climb way too good. And by way too good, I mean in the order of 33% better than what they should. Every single one of them. They turn as they should, but they climb way too too good for what they should. Of course, then there's no compression in the game, so they don't suffer a high speed the way they should. So that's yet another problem with them. And finally, the N1K is totally broken. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not to your fault, mate. The situation you describe is very familiar to me because I've been there as well. And the only explanation is that the N1K is broken. And it's broken. And Gaijin knows it's broken, so sooner or later it's going to be fixed. No worries about that. Right now you have to deal with it as with many other things in the game. Um, but yeah, there's a lot wrong with the demonic Japanese planes. Of course, it can be argued that the problem with the Japanese planes is that they don't have enough planes in the plane set, so they, that should be compensated for with a totally fake clamp rate for the Zeros and a um, bullshit flight model for the, the Sidenkai. But I don't think, think things should work that way. I think Japan needs more planes, needs more fighters, uh, but it also needs proper flying planes. And currently, <laughs> the Zeros are funny, really funny, because they have climbed <laughs> everything. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't. And the N1K really is, is more than your reaction. That thing is, is brutal. And yeah, I know, there are going to be a lot of comments in the comment section below saying that I is totally um, wrong, that the uh, Japanese planes are, are, in, are totally nice. Well, they are not. And if you disagree, feel free to disagree. But I don't know why are you watching my videos if you don't trust my word. If I say those things are broken, they are broken. Trust me. 
please, I know what I'm talking about. The zeros, all of them climb way, way, way too good, and the N1K has a disgraceful um, energy retention model. They also climb too well, and their performance don't go down with altitude as they should. Uh, Component the fact is that they lose no energy sometimes when they should. Of course, I'm not saying there are terminators and that they are no false with them. Someone will come here and say, well, yes, but the Siren Kai can dive. Well, yes, but it can do a lot of things that it shouldn't do. So, <laughs> what are you taking me? Or, or, oh, it has problems with this or that. Well, yes, because the plane had problems with that but it's not having problems with all the things that it should also have problems with. So, yeah, the thing is, the situation is the one it is. Uh, the problem is that, really, the Japanese tree is totally messed up. It's full of uh, overperforming planes, uh, and it's lacking a lot of planes it should have. I mean, the Ki-44, the Ki-84, uh, the J-2M, uh, the Ki-100, there are so many fighters that should be there, but they are not. And then, of course, the lack of jets. So it's it's hard to say that it's terrible to have zeros that overperform, because really Japan doesn't have any doesn't have anything else than zeros. They have Ki 61s, which are excellent fighters, and they are also over overperforming, by the way. Um, but I mean, they have so limited selection of planes that it's really hard for me to say. Japanese planes are broken, but the fact is, the ones that are in the game, they are broken. It's, it's like that. It's, I, I can't hide that. Um, I really think, I really think there should be a patch, just an update, centrated around Japanese planes, fixing the grossly well-performing flight models we have right now and adding a lot more new planes, K44, K84. J2M, Ki-100, uh, even in the N1K1 with float planes, and the float plane would be cool to have. I mean, there are so many places that they are here. The the Nate, the Ki-27, um, which was the army version, well, not the army version, the, the army answer to the A5M. There are so many fighters that they are not there. Uh, and Japan really needs a lot of love. But also needs proper flight models. <laughs> so yeah. Well, that's going to be it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you had fun. Uh, remember to post up the questions you will want to see answered in the next video down below. Also, I don't want to go away as always uh, without well giving a huge, huge thank you to all of those of you who have contributed to my channel and donated some money to 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 me. Really, thanks a lot really appreciate it so yeah that's going to be it for this video guys i hope you enjoy again and as always thank you very much for watching and see you later